house rules. If you have your cell phone, can you just please turn it down? We're actually filming today, so I just want to let you know that you may be on camera, so behave yourselves. <laughs> we have with us today Chief Murphy, Lieutenant Zimmerman, our TA Michael Berto. So I'm very excited these people are here. I want to thank Sherry and uh, Sue for getting this all done. So uh, again this year, very excited to say that Mary and Ryan is here. She's our Middlesex District Attorney. Uh, I'm pleased to sit with her along with Chief Murphy on the task force, OPA task force that we have. So Mary Ryan has been serving as the Middlesex County District Attorney since 2013. She is, oh, did you have phone? No. Oh, is that phone? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Do you mind the staff to shut down our own phones? She is a career prosecutor representing the largest county in the Commonwealth with 54 towns and cities. Can you believe this is the largest county that we live in? From her experience, she has learned that as important as the prosecution is, prevention is equally as important and leads to better outcome. She is a recognized expert at developing and creating innovative solutions that are defined by not simply getting involved after a criminal act has occurred, but instead taking meaningful steps to stop crime before it happens. District Attorney Ryan has worked to ensure the safety of our elders by building partnerships and collaborators among service providers, nonprofits, hospitals, and elder protection agencies. We're very lucky to have her today. Um, I, I always joke with her when I see her. You see her at crime scenes, you see her at meetings, you see her at task force, you see her at fears, and she does this all in heels all the time. <laughs> so, uh, that really impresses me. So welcome to North Ready. Thank you. You know, I would say this even if they were not in the room. I always want to take a minute just to think about, you know, we all think all the time, you know, I pay a lot of money in taxes. What does government do for me? How helpful is all of this? And I just really want to acknowledge, and it is not the case in the rest of the state everywhere. It's certainly not the case across the country. One of the best things about being the DA here is the partnerships we have, and particularly the partnerships we have with our police chiefs and with our town officials. You know, the chief and the town administrator are busy guys. They have lots of stuff to be doing. Fortunately, nothing bad has happened here today, and yet here they are. <coughs> and they're really here just to be part of keeping you safe. So I want to acknowledge Chief Murphy, Lieutenant Zimmerman, Mr. Gilberto. I mean, it's really something that we take for granted in Middlesex County. I'm just coughing a little bit here. Um, we take for granted here that that's part of what they do. But when I talk to my colleagues in other places, they would be thrilled if they even got a return phone call from their police chiefs or their local officials. And yet, they're out here just to do this prevention piece. So I'm very grateful. It makes it possible for me to be able to do my job. And more importantly, it keeps all of you safer. So I think it's just important to take a minute to be grateful for all that we have with that. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, some of the winter kind of scams that are out there, but I want to start, first of all, by talking about what is the number one way that people lose their money and their possessions, and it's very simple. If you got in your car right now and you went over to Market Basket or Stop and Shop or any place like that, I promise you that within the first 20 minutes that you were there, as you walked around, you would see a cart that has a purse sitting in the baby kit, baby seat, right? Yeah. I now literally go up to people and say, you know what, that's going to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And I get it, right? You go out, you're busy. You have, you carry it, I'm the worst offender. You've got your Mary Poppins bag that weighs 175 pounds. It's hanging off your shoulder. You want to be looking at things, you want to pull things off the shelf, you put the bag down in that baby seat. You might as well put a sign on it that says, please steal things from here. Because you, the whole purpose of your putting it in there is because you want to focus over here. And while you're looking over here, somebody's coming by, they're grabbing your wallet, or they're grabbing the bag. And if you're like me, there's not a whole lot of money in my bag. What would be awful if you took my bag is... You'd get all my cards, you'd get my appointment book, you'd get everything. So that is something that's totally preventable. 
First of all, just think a little bit when you're going in the store. You know, you really only need your credit card or your cash, your list, maybe if you have a coupon or something. You don't need to be bringing that whole giant bag with you. So leave that at home. And it's always the other things that are in your bag. You know, it's that piece of jewelry that you put in the bag. It's something special that if you lose that, the likelihood is we're not getting it back. So just think about that. The other place that is really dangerous, and particularly during the holidays, and this is men and women, is parking lots. Because think about it. If I'm a bad guy, I want to get somebody that I can grab their stuff quickly. They're going to be too distracted to be paying attention to me. And I can make a quick exit. So think about just some of the little things that you can be doing. Because what typically happens is you're at the, the mall, you're at the store, you're wherever. Now you've got a bunch of bags. Sometimes the weather isn't very good. You get outside, and first you're doing the search for the car keys. right? You're fishing in your bag, you're looking in your pockets. Sometimes you're very distracted. Sometimes your bag is hanging open and loose. And it's very easy for somebody to come by and grab that. Or you get out there and you want to put the bags in the back seat or the trunk or wherever you're going to do it. So what do people do? They open the front door. A lot of times you open the front door of your car, you put your purse inside. Now you're around the back of the car unloading your things. Very simple. You can't see me. Trunk is up or the other doors are open. Very simple for me, the bad guy, to just grab your bag out of the front of the car. And off I go. By the time you realize it, and think about this, parking lots are dangerous. By the time you realize that I'm over there now with your bag, first of all, if you've seen me, you start running after me. All right, we've had at least a half dozen cases in Middlesex County where somebody has been really badly hurt chasing a thief. And they go flying over those little yellow markers all right, because you got your eye on the bad guy, you're running as fast as you can, and you lose your footing. Or it's bad weather, and you're trying to chase after them, it's slippery underfoot. Down you go, broken hip, whatever. Or you're running, and you're not paying as much attention as you should be, and there's an accident with a car. Because you're cutting through, somebody else is pulling out, they don't expect you. Or the other piece is, and I say sometimes I'm a failure all the time because my own 90-year-old father-in-law was very busy at the store in the back with the back hatch of his car up, putting things in the back of his car. It was a bad day. So he'd come out into the parking lot, he opened up his car, he started the car to start clearing the windows, you know, getting the snow off. So he's got the defrosters on, he shuts the door, he's at the back of his car now, trying to put some wood or something into the back of the car very busy with what he's doing. Bad guy comes along, jumps into the driver's seat. As he's standing there, his car's leaving him. Oh my God. All right? Car's driving away. So now, he starts running after the car. As, and you, you know, as many times as I tell you don't do that, somebody pulls away in your car, somebody grabs your purse, you're going to chase it. As I said to him, what were you going to do if you got caught up with the car? I mean, fortunately, he didn't, and they left with the car. But all those things are kind of preventable. If you just, before you leave the store, kind of think through, what am I going to do? Have your keys in your hand when you head out to the parking lot. When you get out to the parking lot, if you want to put your purse in the front, lock those doors. Open the back. You know, even if it's not perfect, just put your bags in there, straighten them out at home. Just get them in there, get inside your car. You are safer inside your car. So, you know, thieves know, and the, you know, the chief and the lieutenant will tell you, they roam around the parking lot just looking for somebody who's a little bit distracted. You know, the other piece that we've seen a few of is, while you're in the store, they have somehow done something to your car. Your tire's flat, your car's not starting, something. And now you're all flustered. The car won't start. You've got a flat tire or whatever it is. And magically, they appear. Oh, you have a flat. I can help you out. If you have a flat, call AAA. 
Call the police department if you need some help. Do not let the person you never met before in the parking lot help you out. Yeah, maybe they're a great good Samaritan, but they're probably not. So you don't want to let them need your car. It's likely that you're going to end up with some damage to your car. You're going to end up paying them more than you wanted to be paying them. Or you're giving them your phone number or some kind of information. You come out into a parking lot and you have a problem. Initiate your own call. You call somebody in your family, you call AAA, you call the police department. Don't let the person who's driving around the parking lot be the person that helps you. The more winter focused thing is, the first one is, people get a lot of phone calls this time of year from your gas company, your electric company, whatever it is. The call tends to be, you are X dollars behind on your bill. We're going to shut off your heat, your oil, whatever it is, unless you send $300 this afternoon. Okay. And maybe you don't think you're really behind, but they don't want to hear that. Or maybe you have fallen a little bit behind. If the winter's bad and the bills have been high, you've fallen a little bit behind. <coughs> What's important to remember is in Massachusetts, if you are over the age of 60, even if you have had some struggles and you can't pay your bill, if you tell your heating company that you're having a problem with that, they cannot shut off your heat. They have to work with you to resolve that bill. But what happens is, you get that phone call at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know it's supposed to get really cold tonight, and you just get panicked. I don't want the pipes to freeze, I don't want to be here without any heat, and you send off the money. So you get a call demanding that you get put up a lot of cash right now for your heat, call the police station. Do not send them that money. Because we have lots and lots of people who are paying it. And typically what it is, is go to CVS, go to some place, get a, one of those gift cards. There's no heating company that's letting you pay in gift cards. All right. It's the same as when you get that call to pay your taxes, you owe taxes, go get an Apple gift card. The United States government is not running on Apple gift cards. <laughs> but people get flustered. You know, and one of the things that's important to keep in mind about these schemes is, if you got the call while you were here, and you had everybody else to talk to, and you were saying it out loud, they want me to go get a CVS card to pay the bill for my oil, right? That doesn't make any sense. But it happens when you're home. Usually you're home by yourself, and you just get nervous. You don't want to be without heat tonight. So you go off to CVS and you buy the card. You will see one of the things we have worked on if you go to CVS or Walgreens or one of those places this season to legitimately buy a gift card, so you want to buy your grandson a gift card or whatever, when you get to the register and you're paying for that gift card, you will see on that little thing where you put your credit card, the little machine, it will ask you a series of questions. So suppose you're buying a, you know, a restaurant gift card, an IHOP gift card or something there. They will ask you some questions on that little pad. Do you understand that when you pay for this gift card, the money is gone? And are you doing this voluntarily? So one of the reasons we've had the merchants put those questions out there is to give you a last chance to kind of think about, what am I doing? I'm buying a $500 gift card. I'm not even really sure what I'm paying for. And then you can tell the clerk that. It will tell you that right on the screen. If you're uncertain about why you're buying this, talk to the clerk. And they will reach out to the police department and let them know that. So anybody who wants you to buy, buy gift cards is a scam. Just keep that piece in mind. And another piece of that kind of a scam that's happening all over the place, one of the things we worked very hard with some of our representatives in Congress was, if you remember, up until right now still for some of you, the only place your social security number is in a place that you carry publicly is on your Medicare card. So even though we scrambled your social security number on your driver's license so that you, that number is just a fake number, on your social security card is your, I mean on your Medicare card is your social security number. 
everybody in the United States is going to get a new Medicare card that's going to have a scrambled number. So some of you might have already gotten them because they're doing them by birthdays. It's going to take three and a half years to get everybody in the country. So one of the scams is people are getting a phone call that says, hi, this is Social Security. You're getting a new Social Security card. So you think, okay, that's true. I know that's going to happen. We just want to confirm what your Social Security number is. So now you give them your Social Security number. All right. Obviously, that's a way now to get into your bank accounts to do whatever. So do not give anybody your Social Security number if they call you with that. If Social Security doesn't know your Social Security number, we have a problem. Do not be giving them that number. We've had dozens of people give up the number, because it just seems kind of true. You know you're supposed to be getting a new Medicare card. Yeah, okay, sure, let me tell you the number. Or they start out and they say, is your Social Security number 013? And you jump in and say, oh, no, that's not my number. My number's 020. Now they've got it. Okay, so that's an important piece. In terms of like the bad weather, um, the scam that continues to be amazing to me is the amount of money that people get from people about snow removal. If you need the snow shoveled at your house, you know, off your walk or your sidewalk or whatever, or this is a really big expense, you've got a roof that needs the snow taken off, you know, your garage roof or your addition or whatever, you need to have that done you make the call to get the person to do that. You can probably get some recommendations here at the senior center. The town may have some people. People are coming around saying, oh, you know, I happen to be down the street working on the house. Your, your addition over here has got two feet of snow on it. I can clear that for you. You don't want that to start leaking tonight. You're thinking, well, no, I don't. I really don't want that to happen. And now they do it. They come back to the door, $1,100. Well, you didn't ask them how much it is. Now they're standing in your kitchen. You don't know how to get them out. People get panicked, and they write that check. So we have had people with all kinds of money, for all kinds of money, to clear the snow off their house. So if you didn't call the person, don't be letting them do any work on your house. I had a guy show up at my house. This is how random these are. I had a guy show up at my house on Saturday, Sunday morning when it was pouring rain. So I'm at home in my house. The guy shows up, rings my doorbell, and says, terrible rainstorm. And I'm thinking, who are you? Why are you at my house at 10 in the morning? And he said, I noticed that your gutter is filling up on the front of your house. So I said, oh, OK. And he said, you know, I can go right up right now and clear your gutter out because you have your, I have my Christmas tree up and my lights and whatever. And he said, you don't want that water to start backing up and coming down in the wall inside your house. Now, even though I know I had my own gutters cleaned, and if I needed my gutter cleaned, I'd be sending my husband up to do the gutters. I'm thinking, no, I really don't want I got company coming today. I don't want water coming in my house. So I said, okay, thanks. Maybe I'll get my husband to come out and look at it. Well, all of a sudden, he wasn't quite so interested in talking to me anymore. All right, because now he knows there's somebody else there. Yeah. I've got my husband there, and now he's just kind of like walking back down the stairs. Mm. So they're showing up everywhere. They make you a little bit nervous because you don't want any of those things to do. They, the famous conversation is you're going to have an ice dam. Yeah. I'm not even really clear what an ice dam is, but we seem to be paying a lot of money to get rid of ice dams. So just be cautious about that. And the same is true with cutting trees. So you got a lot of people showing up saying, you know, that's your tree. There's a lot of heavy snow on that. You don't want it to come down on your car. We had a guy last year who paid $7,100 to have branches taken off his tree. All right. We had a woman not very far from here, thousands and thousands of dollars. The guy showed up at her house. It was after one of those awful storms. She knew she did have branches that needed to be trimmed back. He said, I can do them. You know, at some level, I think she's thinking, perfect. I was going to have to look for somebody. Here's somebody right here. Guy goes out to do the trees. There's two of them. They take the branches down. Now they're in her kitchen. One of them is carrying one of those power tools. She's home alone. And they're telling her it's $4,800. Now, 
she didn't ask them how much it was going to cost because she figured how much was it going to be. They're making her nervous. You know, they're intimidating. They're two big guys. They got a one of those zip saws in their hand. They want $4,800, and she just wants them out of her house. Yeah. You know, she was smart. She wrote the check. She gave them the check. The second they walked out the door, she called the police department. Yeah. Now, here's what they're doing, and it gives you an idea of just how clever they're being about it. If you write me a check, suppose you bank at the Bank of North Reading. You write me a check. I take that check and I go to Bank of America, where I do my banking, and I deposit that check or I cash that check. It's going to take a couple of days for that check to make its way back to Bank of North Reading. So if in the meantime you discover a problem with whatever you paid me for, your bank will stop payment on that check. If you give me that check and I hop in my car and I go to your bank, and cash that check. The money's out of your account already. So in fact, when she called the police, they called her bank. They were literally in the lobby at that point because you can't stop the payment on the check then. All right. So the other piece of it is people get embarrassed. You know, they give up that big check. They give up their social security number. They're, they realize 10 minutes later, I shouldn't have done that. But they're embarrassed to tell the police. They're hoping maybe nothing bad will happen. Something bad is going to happen. So just as fast as you can, as she did, just call the police. Because they were able to stop them in the lobby of the bank. She didn't lose her $4,800. So, you know, the other piece of it is, in terms of letting people in your house, the only thing that's really protecting you from the people outside is that door of your house. The second you let them in your kitchen or let them in your front hall, how are you going to get them out of there? You know, that's the problem. So your conversation, have a conversation through the door. At least have a conversation through your storm door with the door locked. Because it's very hard to get rid of somebody once they have their feet in your house. And you feel, as she did, very vulnerable. The two big guys, they were in her kitchen. She was home alone. She just didn't know how to get rid of them. The other piece where people are taking a lot of advantage, and you've probably seen them, you come home and you see the little cardboard in your door, and it says chimney cleaning or furnace cleaning, $50. And you think, well, that's kind of a good deal. And you call up. So what typically happens is you call up, yep, I'd love to get that $50 furnace cleaning. The guy shows up. He comes over, he goes down to your furnace, he's cleaning the furnace, and at some point he comes up and he says, I got bad news for you. This thing of a bob here that you've never seen before, look at this right here. It's worn through, and now you got carbon monoxide leaking in your house. And you're thinking, well, what's that going on? Well, how do I fix that? Well, I'm going to buy two thingamabobs and stick them together with duct tape and that's going to cost you $4,000. And suddenly the $50 furnace cleaning is $4,000. So first of all, a furnace cleaning should never cost you more than about $100. And it never takes more than about 90 minutes. So if somebody came and they were in your house too long, something's going on. And again, you think you need your furnace cleaned, call your oil company, call whoever, you, somebody you know, don't let anybody come to you and solicit that job. Same is true with the chimney. You'll get the sign that says chimney cleaning, you know, $90, $100, you think good deal. Because a regular chimney cleaning is about $250. You think that's a great deal. The next thing you know, they're in your house, they're telling you there's bricks coming out of the wall in your chimney. Well, you're not going up the chimney to check. So now you're thinking, well, i got to fix that. And suddenly it's a whole lot of money. And they're also probably roaming around a little bit in your house. Um, I say all the time, you know, one of the most violent house invasions we've prosecuted in the last couple of decades in Middlesex County happened with somebody who used a company 
pretty reliable company that they sort of knew about, but the people that they knew from the company supposedly weren't there anymore. Two guys showed up at their house before the holidays. They were going to have these two guys do a little painting, freshen up, you know, the house for the holidays, do a little carpet cleaning, paint a little bit, whatever, which they did. That was all great. And when they got done with the job, off they went, they got paid, see you later, they left. The following Sunday, the wife gets a phone call. And the call is, you know, this is Joe, I was just at your house painting, whatever. I mistakenly left something in the basement. I left some kind of a ladder or a piece of something in the basement. Could I swing by and pick it up? Right? Everybody in this room is going to say, sure. Over they came. They tied up and beat both the husband and wife. They eventually took the wife in the car, took her to the bank, and demanded that she take from the ATM almost exactly the amount of money that they had in their account. How did they know that? Because one of the rooms they were painting or freshening up was the den. In the den, the husband had a desk. In the desk drawer were meticulously their checking statements and bank records. So, of course, you know, when people are in your house, you can't watch them every minute. You go to the bathroom, you answer the telephone, you do something. And they opened the drawer, they looked in, they knew what bank they banked at, and they looked at the statement and knew what the balance was in that account. So, you have somebody in your house, get prepared for that. You know, put those things away, don't leave things like your bills, that you might have, you know, I have a stack of bills that I need to pay. They're usually sitting around. You want to put those away. They can get a lot of information off that. They can get your credit card numbers. If you've obviously, and you've probably heard this, if you've got prescriptions, you know, a prescription medication now, an opiate prescription medication is selling for a dollar a milligram. So if you've got a bunch of 50 milligram pills, they're each worth $50. You wouldn't let somebody come in your house with a stack of 50s on the kitchen table. Make sure you put your medication away. <clears throat> you know, just assume that anybody who's in your house is looking around at what they see there and getting that kind of information. And it's that information as well that is often the basis for the other kind of calls you get. One of the calls you've probably seen because it's gotten a little bit of press, but we've been prosecuting lately a lot of the calls where people are being taken by the grandparents scam. And there's sort of two variations of the grandparent scam. One is the little kids, you get the phone call, we know your little granddaughter is singing in a concert tonight or skating in a hockey rink, whatever. Something bad will happen if you don't give us X amount of money. All right? Don't call their parents, don't call the police, whatever. People are giving that money. The more complicated and now more common, we just had a man up in Lowell lost $80,000. The call you get is, this is Marion Ryan, I'm a lawyer out in Colorado. Your grandson, Michael, who's at the University of Colorado, was stopped last night for bad driving, some kind of bad driving. And when the police stopped him, they found drugs in the car. He's in jail here. We need you to send bail money. He said, please don't call my mom and dad. So the amount we need is $4,000. You have to send it by 3 o'clock today or the, or the judge is going to hold them in jail. Sometimes they say, and here's Chief Murphy, he'll tell you about it. Now they pass the phone, a man gets on the phone, yes, this is Chief Murphy, yes, we stopped your son's car under the front seat, we found a bag of marijuana. They tell you some story. Well, kind of sounds legitimate. Sometimes the next part of the conversation is, you hear a young man get on the phone, he sounds all kind of sniffly and crying. Nana, it's Michael. It wasn't mine. I gave another kid a ride. Now you're thinking, oh, stupid kid. Please don't call mom and dad. Just send the money. People are sending that money. A lot of people are sending that money. And then the next call you get is they need more money for something else. <coughs> now they need an expert for his trial. Now they'd like to get him some treatment. Whatever it is, and before you know it, you are, as that gentleman in Lowell, you're $80,000 into it. One of the reasons those calls work is what I talked about before. You're sort of by yourself, you get nervous. Oh, God, my poor grandson's out there in jail. 
I want to help them out. The other piece is, and just really think about this, is if you didn't have a grandson named Michael, and he didn't go to the University of Colorado, you would have hung up in the very beginning. You stay on the phone because you do have a grandson named Michael, and he does go to school out there. So they make you think this is for real. One of the ways that people do that is, number one, they're in your house, and they're looking around at what's there. You've got the call, you know, a note from the University of Colorado to the grandparents. You've got, you're posting things on Facebook. Michael's coming home from Colorado on Monday. Freshman year has gone great. And your settings are not private. Everybody has seen that. Right? The other way that I am convinced, this is the way the most amount of information gets out. You are at, and I'll just sort of challenge you if you want to be a bad guy, figure this out. The next, sorry, Chief. They didn't hear that. The next time you were at a doctor or the clinic or the hospital or whatever, pretend you were a bad guy and you were trying to collect information and just listen to what people are saying. All right? So a typical one is you go to the doctor. Doctor says, I want to see you in three weeks. So now you're out there. You're making your appointment at the counter. The lady behind the counter says, how about January 2nd? Oh, no, 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 I can't come January 2nd. You know, Bob and I are taking all the kids to Disney World. My son's coming from here. My grandson's coming from Colorado. Talk, 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 talk. Or you're sitting in the lobby waiting to go into the dialysis clinic or whatever. You strike up a conversation with somebody else. Oh, I can't wait for next week. My grandson's coming home from Colorado. Talk, 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 talk. Well, did you ever notice there's people who just float around in those places? <laughs> All right? It's a lot of information. And again, especially if I'm somebody who works there, I know where you live. I know what kind of neighborhood you live in. I know whether you have private health insurance. So I have a good sense who might be able to come up with $4,000. Because that's the other piece of it. I'm sure everybody here knows people that even if their grandchild was really at risk, they couldn't come up with $1,000 this afternoon. They just couldn't. They could not put their hands on $1,000. What we see is those people never get that phone call. The people who get the phone call are the people who have a little bit of money. And how do they know that? They're not randomly calling people. They're somehow figuring out who people are. Think about this. If you've never done it before, when you go home, go on Google. Go to Google Earth and Google your own house. If I know your address, Google Earth is so good now, I not only can see your house, I can see the kind of cars you have in the driveway. So I Google Earth your house. It's lovely. It's very well maintained. You've got beautiful Christmas decorations up. You've got two nice SUVs sitting in the driveway. You could probably come up with 2,500 bucks. All right? So the bad guys have been greatly helped by technology. There's nothing you can do about that. But when people talk to you about keeping your own personal information private, it's more than just your bank accounts. It's more than your social security number. It's those kind of things. Because if I want to be, use it for bad purposes, it's very easy for me to get that information and then call you up and make it sound like I know a whole lot more. So a famous call that's really going around right now is you get a phone call, you pick it up. Hi, this is Johnny Smith. Oh, hi, Johnny. I know you don't remember me. I grew up up the street. I played ball with your boys. Well, you don't remember him at all. You haven't thought about who the boys played ball with for a long time, but you don't want to be rude. Oh, hi, Johnny. Nice to talk to you. Well, we're getting people together for the holidays, and I'm just trying to reach your son. Oh, Michael or Stephen? Oh, Stephen. Oh, well, Stephen doesn't live here anymore. Stephen's married. He lives over in Andover. He's got two girls. All of a sudden, whole lot of information. 
three weeks from now, you get the call about your granddaughter in Andover. Again, you think they know you because you do have a granddaughter in Andover. So when we've asked people who've been taken in by those scams, did anything happen in the weeks before it, a lot of times they say, in thinking about it, yeah, I got that call. Well, when they go and check with their son, no one ever called them to put together a holiday party. That wasn't true. Okay, and again, you just kind of get taken in by some of the information they're giving you. We had a woman, I was doing one of these talks last week, and while I was talking, <coughs> a woman in the audience raised her hand and said just the day before she got a call, it was the lawyer scam call. And the woman said to her, you know, this is the person, I'm the lawyer. I'm calling about your grandson. And she said, who? And they said, well, here, we'll let you talk to him. So she, young man gets on the phone and says, Nana? And she says, is this Johnny? Oh. Yeah, it's Johnny. <laughs> All right, so now you're already thinking that's Johnny on the phone. And really, the only thing that saved her, she was very lucky. They were going through, and her husband happened to be there, who was a retired court officer. And at some point, the woman said, we need $1,400 for bail. And she was writing everything down. She was really nervous and worried about Johnny. And her husband said, bail never gets set at $1,400, which it usually doesn't. Usually set in multiples of 500 And he said, nobody sets $1,400 bail. So he got on the phone, and he started yelling at the people. And sure enough, they hung up. And when they called Johnny, Johnny was at work. He wasn't in jail. So, but, you know, she got so <laughs> flustered. My grandson's in jail. Nana? Johnny? Now they've got that piece of information. So just be aware. You know, probably the single biggest takeaway from all this is, right now there's really no need to be answering your phone when you don't know who's on the phone. Let the phone go to a message. If it's important, they will find you. And because then you don't get in that conversation. And the second piece is when you want something done, you initiate that call. You find a company, I need the trees cut down, I need the furnace cleaned, I need whatever. Don't ever take advantage of the people who show up at your door or who put a sign on your door, whatever that is. You know, there's the famous driveway scam. I'm, I'm, paving the driveway at the house next door, I have some extra finish, I can do your driveway. That never works out well. Um, and not only what we've been seeing lately is not only is the stuff, used to be they'd fool around with your driveway the next time it rained, the new finish washed down the driveway. Now whatever they're putting down on people's driveway is actually damaging their driveway. So it's costing you money. You paid $500 for them to make the driveway look good for 10 minutes it rains, it's now breaking up, and you end up having to have it jackhammered off your driveway. So make your own decisions. If you're looking for somebody, you know, the Better Business Bureau rates people, your Chamber of Commerce will have people. I'm sure the Senior Center has some reliable people you can use. You can check with the police department. Um, just don't get involved with people that you don't know. So I'm happy to take some questions. If people have questions about how to protect yourself, keep your money safe, keep your property if yourself you're looking safe. looking for tradespeople, what about Angie's List? Yeah. Or Home Advisor? Are those, the those seem to be pretty rep. I mean, let's put it this way I've never heard of anybody having a problem with those, so they seem a little bit more reputable. Um, it's certainly better than somebody who comes to the door oh, and is looking for you. Somebody comes to the door. But, yeah. um, where are you finding, where are people finding them if it's not? Like Angie's List or Home Advisor is, I mean, is it just not a phone Better phone? Business, the Chamber of Commerce, <laughs> a lot of those places. Um, a lot of towns, a lot of the cities and towns, I don't know if any does, a lot of the cities and towns have a list of people that have come into town and been successful at work. You know, which still doesn't mean you're not going to get the bad person. Um, the other piece, which is really important to keep in mind, and people don't always know this is, you know when you, um, hire a plumber or something. And it might say John Smith, the plumber, and there's a license number on that. You're going to pay more money if you have a person, any kind of contractor, 
if they are licensed, you pay more money for them to come. What you buy for yourself, for buying that is, the people who are licensed, they pay dues into the licensing authority for electricians, plumbers, whatever. What it gives you is, you use a licensed plumber. The licensed plumber does a bad job, or they take your money and they don't show up, whatever it is, and you can't find them. If that's Joe the plumber, your money's gone. If you use a licensed plumber, you can go to that licensing authority and you can apply to get at least some of your money back. You're not going to get it all back, but you might get, you know, 50 cents on the dollar back or something. So that's the value to using somebody who is licensed, even though it costs you a little bit more, you buy yourself some insurance. But, of course, I can take my truck and write Mary and Ryan licensed electrician, number 1259. You have to actually, you can go online or you can call, you call that the licensing, plumbing licensing authority, whatever it is, and say, could you tell me if Mary and Ryan has a license? And they can tell you, yes, she does, it's 1259. So that's why people advertise that way. That's why they put it on their truck. It's often on the top of your bill if you use a tradesperson who's licensed. But you do buy yourself that extra insurance if you use somebody like that. Yeah? So just to, to add to that, uh, in, in North Reading, if you live here, you know you, you have a septic system. And one area where the town is pretty strict with licensing is for repairing or replacing those systems. So if you have an issue with your septic system, I would encourage you to contact the Board of Health to see if the company you're looking at is licensed to do the work. We have a pretty strict licensing requirement. We can't recommend somebody for you, but we can provide you a list of who's licensed to do the work. Um, and that's something that the Chief has worked closely with the, the Board of Health on to make sure. Because it's an area to easily be victimized. You can't see the work that they're doing, it's all on the ground. <laughs> yeah. um, and we have had instances where people have been, um, they've been ripped off, honestly. So. Yeah. It's like your furnace or your chimney. You don't know whether the thing is really broken or it isn't. They bring you this thing and say, look at this, this is awful. <laughs> You're like, okay, yeah, I guess that must be awful. Yeah. What if you have a contract, what if you have signed a contract and then, you know, you, you, the next day when you're reading the full contract, you find something on it that they've charged you for, but you didn't authorize, and now you're paying for it because on the bottom of the contract it says there's no cooling off period. What are, uh, what are your rights as far as a consumer goes? So, in Massachusetts, depending on what kind of contract it is, mm -hmm. we do have some wiggle room on some contracts, you know, like you buy a car, there's a lemon law thing, you can, in, you know, a certain number of days you can get out of that contract. Yeah. Some you can. Now, if they've already done the work, you're probably stuck. Really? Um, so that's why it's important to really, and think about it, really read through before you do it. Mm -hmm. um, or, and also, you know, the reality is, whatever you're having done, there probably is some other cost you haven't quite thought about. You know, or sometimes people run it together and it all sides, but yeah, there's going to be some storage fee. Okay, yeah, I, I did hear you say that. I wasn't thinking the storage fee was going to be $4,000. And that's what we get a lot of those calls. Unfortunately, often that is not criminal. You might be able to sue them on the contract, but it's not really a crime that you bought a bad deal. So be careful about that when you're signing the contract. You know, ask a lot of questions. Be really sure you understand exactly what you're paying for. Um, you know, it's like one of the most common ones. We get calls all the time about this, and it's, it is a ripoff. It's clearly not a crime. You buy tickets online. You know, you buy tickets to some show or some performance or whatever. The tickets are whatever amount they are. And there is some outrageous handling fee or something per ticket. You know, you think it's going to be a $40 handling fee for that transaction of five tickets, and then you find out it's $5 a ticket, it's 200 bucks. The tickets themselves barely cost $200. That's a bad deal. That's a really extravagant fee. It's not a crime. So we're not going to be able to help you with that. 
So that's why, and especially when you're buying things or ordering things, if you're doing it, you know, you're emailing it or you're doing it online, make sure you really got to the bottom line. Because people find themselves a lot with those extra things. They just didn't know that we're going to be paying for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, did you have a question? No, no. I, it just a make. stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Can Anybody I just remind people, too, if you um, have a licensed contractor and they are our license, and then you have a problem and you're dealing with an insurance company and they come back and, you know, at least you can go back and say, I had a license for us and do this. I took out the permit from the town to do this. Right. So I know sometimes it sounds like a pain in the neck is going to cost you more, but in the long run, if something comes back and your bank said, we don't know anything about this, you have proof that, you know, you have a permit right. with the town and, you know, it, you can be insured for it. And that's really true. I mean, the reality is, when I say you're going to pay more for the licensed contractor, you are. Yeah. I mean, it's probably going to be, you know, a good increase from what some, you know, from what Joe the plumber would charge you. At the end of the day, it may well be worth it. But people sometimes think, you know, I don't want to pay that much more. This doesn't seem like such a big deal. And then something bad happens. So sometimes if it's too good to be true, it really is too good to be true. Um, you know, or you've had five contractors. I, this is, I think, is always sad. Somebody will have, you know, four contractors come out and tell them what it's going to cost to put a deck on. And it's whatever. All the contractors are kind of in the same price range. And then somebody shows up and says, I can do that for you for half. And then they don't. And now they're suddenly back to us saying, I lost all this money, or they took the money and they disappeared. You know, as, I love a bargain as much as anybody, but I'd be thinking long and hard about that if something is so much cheaper. Okay. Yeah. I'd just like to say, if you, if you think it's a problem, call the police. If it's nothing, they'd rather show up for nothing yeah. than for you to not call them and then have to come to solve the problem. So when in doubt, you can call them. And even if you think that's a good point, I mean, as I said, even if you know you've done something foolish, you just gave out your social security number on the phone. It's better that we fix it now than we wait till you get your bank statement next month and you're missing $5,000. So, you know, people think, I don't want my kids to know I was foolish enough to do that. I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. And they wait, and then you are in a real mess. Yeah. I think credit card companies are the biggest scam. Mm -hmm. Uh, you get daily pre-approved yeah. lending companies, and if you're in a jam, you may be uh, obliged or obligated to respond to that. Then you get a notice <coughs> that there's so much percentage rate for uh, annual or monthly, and people are, t are taken in by all these yeah. 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 scams of credit cards. So the biggest one probably is you get that envelope that says consolidate all your credit card debt, you know, 1% interest a month. And you think, this is great. The answer to my problems. Well, it's 1% for a month for the first month, and then it goes to 35%. But you didn't read that stuff that was on the bottom. Yeah. The other thing to be really careful of, um, and I got one in the mail yesterday, actually. You get that credit card that's pre-approved. All right, so it's made out with your name, it's got a number, it's there. You, I'm interested. You open the envelope, you realize what it is, you're happy with your credit cards, you don't need any credit cards, you throw it away. There is nothing to stop somebody from taking that out of your trash and using it now with your name. So, you know, be sure you're shredding that stuff, you know, either taking it to a real shredder or at least cutting it up into enough pieces and dropping it in different waste baskets that it doesn't all end up together. And the other piece, and this is probably the most valuable piece because people ask me all the time, how do you stop getting those phone calls? Oh, yeah. You know, which I'd be rich if I did know that, but what I have learned is, and this is actually a trick that works. So I'm a business and I want to buy a list of phone numbers to call. I buy a list of phone numbers, just randomly generated phone numbers, right? I don't know when I buy those, whether any of those are good numbers. And a certain percentage of those numbers are going to be the people don't live in there anymore, they never answer their phone, they're going to be not valuable numbers. 
So those numbers sell very cheaply. All right, it's actually less than this, but let me just make this up as to make it round. Suppose those numbers sell for a nickel a piece. So I, the business, buy 500 numbers at a nickel a piece, and maybe 75% of those numbers I actually get to a person, right? So I wasted the money I spent to the other 25%. If I dial your number, or my robocalls dial your number, and you pick your phone up and you say hello, even if you then say, no, I'm not interested, thank you, and you hang up, you have now told me that that number is a valid number. So that number, your number, when I sell it to the next person, that number is worth a quarter. So by picking your phone up and saying, I'm sorry, I'm not interested, it's a bad time, whatever you say, you have made your own number more valuable. So if your number, you don't answer your phone, you just let it go to the machine, the robocall doesn't know. Is that just a machine and the people have, are in a nursing home or a hospital, they don't live there anymore, you're going to Florida for three months. I don't know any more about your number than I did before. So by not answering your phone, you actually are going to reduce the number of calls that you get. So that's just an important piece. I hate to hear a ringing phone. So lots of times I would pick up the phone just to make it stop. But you're making your num you're increasing the number of calls you're going to get. You might also have seen last Tuesday, last Thursday, um, Senator Markey filed some legislation that would, you know, there is a penalty for people continuing to call numbers where people have said, I don't want to be called. Nobody ever enforces that penalty. You know, it's a, some kind of a fine. He filed legislation that greatly increased the fines and will make it mandatory that that be enforced. So if that's something that drives you crazy, you might want to support that legislation. You know, write a letter <coughs> to support that legislation or something. Or at least just keep an eye on it. Because if that legislation passes, it's going to make it much more expensive mm -hmm. for the company. Because what happens is, you know, you say I'm going to be on the no-call list. Okay, you're on the no-call list over here, but then they sell your number over here. So you're not on this no-call list. So it's just kind of like that, that kid's game of whack-a-mole, you can't stop it. This would make it much more costly if they don't honor that. Yeah? So what I do is, if it rings and it says, like, RNC, okay, I click the answer and then hang up right after. That still triggers them that it's a good call. They know that somebody's there. Because right. it makes me crazy. It drives me crazy when the phone rings. Phone rings. Yeah. But the other thing is that there are a lot of, I can't, we can't seem to get a lot of calls with the North Reading Exchange. Right, you know, that's spoofing. And, yeah. Right, and that is, one time I got one and I did a dial back because the name kind of looked familiar and I wanted that person to know, hey, someone's using mm. your phone. Well. It said this number is no longer in service. Right. I got one on the way here, and it was a number that looked just like one of our office numbers. Right. So I called it back, and you get that. So right. there's a, you can spoof the number. If you haven't had it happen, the weirdest one of those is sometimes you get a phone call, and it's your own number. Yeah. 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 So you're thinking, right. I'm calling myself. Right. But they do that just so you'll pick it up. Right. Because right. obviously, like in Bel I live in Belmont, we get calls a lot that say town of Belmont. Yeah. Yeah. So you think yeah. it's a reverse 911. Mm -hmm. Right. It's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's just a good reason to let your phone go to the answering machine. Does this apply to that phone to uh, surveys? Like I get a lot of calls of that survey. I don't even know, answer the phone. Right. I don't know what the surveys are going to be like, and I haven't got the time to be bothered with it. But they are pestering me right. with survey calls. Have you had any? Yeah, that, I get those. I actually get those calls a lot myself. So, so what, do you, what do you do? I don't answer. You don't answer. I don't answer. I mean, you know, one, and for instance, you notice if you're home during the day, your phone rings 20 times. Yes. It's nothing. I mean, one solution, obviously, is to turn your ringer down and just let it go straight to the machine. But, you know, that's why they're doing it, because they think you're going to pick it up. So that's the whole point, yeah. If you have an iPhone, there's, when you get those, un, you know, unknown calls, right. 
um, don't pick them up. But then afterwards, you on recent, you just click recent calls, and mm -hmm. and there's a little I, mm -hmm. the, a little the information thing. I. Yeah. If you press that on your iPhone, you're allowed to block that call. Yeah. And I do that, and and um, I get less, I get fewer and fewer calls. You know, but I I did get that spoofing mm -hmm. um, recently, and when I was on the phone talking to somebody, I saw myself calling me back. Yeah. So I called the um, the FCC. I think it's the FCC. I don't know. Yeah. These acronyms drive me crazy. But anyway, I called them and re, re reported it and filled out a complaint, and they said that. The woman said that, you know, if you do get those things, you, you really need to report them because they they have more likelihood of passing legislature that would, you know, help us eliminate these things if more people did. Right, right. It is, a, it is a good thing to report them. I mean, sometimes you don't have the half hour to sit on the phone uh, no, trying to make the report. Yeah. You know, but what we, like, we encourage people, if you get a scam call, like if you get one of those grandparent calls, yeah. you know, tell people here at the senior center, report it to the police station, because they don't happen in isolation. Mm -hmm. If you're getting them, 10 other people in North Reading are getting them. You know, the senior center is good about putting up notes. The newspaper is good about putting it out there. Just so people have in their head when they get that call. Oh yeah, that, I heard about that, that's a yeah. scam. You know, just like the social security card. So that if somebody calls about your social security card, you know that's a scam. Yeah. Um, what if the call comes in and you hit ignore when you have it on your they phone? They still know a okay. live that's person did that. That's what I wanted to know, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to let them know that any live person, you know, sometimes I'll pick up my phone the same as that and just hang it up, yeah. but then they know somebody was there. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.